Yeah. And then right yeah, into the special character yeah. where the cursor is. Okay. That's how to wire up um, a device. Um, not necessarily the, the most favoured device because now I need minus five volts, but I think there's another way of wiring up where we can avoid that minus five volts. But there's, there's Sorry, an example on. here where I'm only using five volts and ground. This is the thing that provides the contrast between the two. So there's off um, eight lines here plus three here. So that's 11 and then 12, 13, 14. That's all the 14 pins on the LCD. Uh, for us, in order to control it, we're actually only using 11 pins on the microcontroller. Whether you use an LCD that has 16 characters in one row, uh, 32 characters across two rows, 40 characters, whatever, it's the same interface. So that's quite nice. Right, the final thing on displays, um, We've talked about dumb seven-segment displays, we've talked about silly LEDs, we've talked about using dumb seven-segment displays with external latching and decoding. Um, I've talked briefly about LCD displays. Um, the nice thing about LCD displays, of course, is they're cheap. Um, an alternative um, you might come across is something called intelligent displays. Intelligent displays typically are LED-based, and they have decoder logic built into them. Um, the nice thing about them is they give very high contrast, nice sort of writing and whatever, but a module like this one, which is I think like a Hewlett Packard one, Siemens do them as well, might cost somewhere between 10 and 15 pounds for a four digit display. So compared to an LCD equivalent, they're much more expensive. But if you've got loads of spare money in your design and build budget and you want a display that really stands out, then these can be quite nice. Um, they provide the same kind of um, address decoding technique, uh, sorry, address decoding, the same way of kind of programming technique as we used for the LCD. And this is the kind of the character set that a typical one can provide you with. I've just included the timing here and um, one of the things about these is compared to an LCD, I said in the case of the LCD, having written one character, there's usually quite a long delay until you write the next character. With these ones, that tends to be much less of a problem. Um, you can update them a lot quicker. But there's an example of the timing. I'm not going to test you on any of this, but it's there if you wanted to know about them. Okay. So, let's move on to this week's topic. We'll make a start today, and then my plan is to finish it tomorrow morning in the first hour, and then in the second hour, or part thereof, um, we'll, I'll talk briefly about some revision. Okay, so analog speech of conversion. Um, I'll just pretty much read what it says here, so I can make this bigger. So it converts an analog um, signal of some descriptions, which is an analog voltage, into a digital number representing the magnitude of the analog signal. Um, in the case of digital things, there are a finite sort of number of finite number of numbers available to represent the magnitude of the signal. Um, so in terms of the dig digital signal, uh, the number is represented in discrete steps. The, the, the resolution determines how many bits are used to represent that digital number. So, for example, if I'm trying to I have some kind of analog signal here that's uh, changing over time um, and I'm sampling it at various discrete points in time Effectively, I say, is this above or below this threshold? Down here, it's here. So this thing here, I would say, well, the closest digital representation of that particular value that I have is the value zero. So I'd write 
And that assumes it's a three bit thing, so I write out zero, zero, zero at sample point A. At sample point B, um, it's crossed this threshold, it's in this sub range. Now, the actual value of it is here, um, but I also can do is represent it by which sub range it belongs to. So, this I write out zero, zero, one in this case. Um, at C, depending on, let's say it could be here, um, it would have to be on this transition point, it will either be at the top end of the two or the bottom end of the three. If you imagine the middle of the sub range is when you're most accurate, we're right at the kind of limit of the accuracy at this point here, and I could write out, for example, that C has got the value 0, 1, 1, and then in the case D, it would be 0, 1, 0, 0, whatever. Um, so, um, in terms of a digital system, um, what we can do is represent the analog signal as a, a series of digital samples of that signal, and here's the definition that you'd be expected to know of resolution. So, it's the number of binary bits used to represent an analog signal, um, sorry, an analog signal amplitude, or the magnitude of it. Um, the number of bits which are used to represent that signal um, has a direct bearing on its fidelity, the accuracy with which we can reproduce it. And I'll show you that in subsequent slides. The frequency at which we sample um, is 1 over the time between the samples, nothing remarkable there. But what you would be expected to know is about Nyquist. Now, let me skip on to that and then come back. So, in the yellow box, you would be expected to know that um, in order to reproduce an analog signal um, accurately, um, you must sample that signal at least twice the highest frequency that you wish to reproduce. I think you probably meant that near one anyway. So yeah, some people are nodding. So now let's go back for a minute. Oops. Here we've got an example where the dotted line is an analog signal, and I've sampled it um, quite a short instance. Um, I don't know what the resolution is here, but you can see that the, the representation, the digital, like the digital um, representation of it, is quite a reasonable approximation to the original analog signal. So if we sample it um, at sampling instance, which are relatively close together, relative to the frequency of the signal, we're able to reproduce it quite well. Here's a similar kind of setup, but in this particular case, we're sampling it, if you like, at too lower frequency. The sampling frequency is too low. So if we were then to reproduce this, we'd get this kind of square shape here. So from that sampling instance to the next one, the output would be writing this out. But this instance would write this one out. Then the next sample would be here, so it would write out this. The next sample would be here, and so on. You can see that the output signal bears little or no relation to the input signal, which would result in extreme distortion. I've changed this from the slide in your notes, because one of your notes, I didn't quite like the fact that the, um, the sampling instance weren't all the same. They weren't regular. Uh, this is kind of showing you this concept of aliasing. Basically, we're sampling it at far too low a frequency here. If we were to guess, based on our samples, what the shape of the waveform is, um, you can see that, based on our samples, it looks like that, effectively, what we're sampling is a waveform that looks like that. It looks like it's got that kind of frequency component within it. In fact, that frequency component isn't in there at all. This is a, the original signal is a sine wave of a much higher frequency. But based on our samples, if we were to reproduce the signal, we'd end up, if you like, reproducing a signal of a frequency that didn't exist in the original. Uh, that would be known as an alias. So it's a kind of false lower frequency that doesn't exist in the original signal. Again, this is showing that same kind of thing. So we've got not very well drawn sine wave in two cases. In this instance, I'm sampling it 
how was it? One, two, three, four, five samples in in one period. So that's just a little bit higher than twice the frequency. And in this case, I'm sampling below the microsc rate. And you can see in this particular case, um, I, I'm able to reproduce the period of that signal pretty well. I could do some filtering, I could use a low pass filtering so that the actual signal I get out is a sinusoid. Um, in this particular case, I've sampled it at far too low a frequency, and so I would end up effectively, um, if I was using reproducing the signal, I'd be reproducing a frequency that didn't exist in the original. Okay. You would be expected to know what you have to provide a definition of quantization. Um, so quantization is this process where I can. I'll read it out. The continuous range of input signal values is divided into non-overlapping sub-ranges. Quantization errors defines the difference between the actual analog value and its digital representation. So, the only way to reduce the magnitude of the quantization error is to increase the resolution um, of your analog to digital conversion system. I have more steps where there's a smaller, the, the size of the sub-range is decreasing. Um, this slide is showing you a sinusoid, and it's also showing you if you sample it at a certain point in time, what the magnitude of the error would be. So, for example, at time zero here, that's the actual signal, um, but we can only represent it by these discrete levels. So we've chosen to represent it by four. But actually, the, sig the real signal is not the four, it's a three and a half. But we have no way of representing, representing three and a half, so we have to say, oh, it's four. Our only other choice would be three. Um, as the actual signal gets higher and higher, eventually we get to the point where the actual signal is at four, which is, um, if we sample it at that point in time, our representation of it and the actual value would have no difference between them. And then we've got, so you can see that the magnitude of the error is following this kind of pattern here. So the error is bad, bad, and then as we get closer to the actual threshold for that particular level, uh, the, the, um, the error reduces, and then as we move away from it, it increases until we get to the next level, and so on. So, important definition to remember. Just do one more slide, I think. Um, in terms of analog circuitry, um, often when we're trying to sample it to work out the magnitude of its value, we can't do that instantaneously. In fact, there's no system where we can do it instantaneously. It takes time. The problem is the analog signal is changing over time. So if, we're sa if we've kind of sampled it and we're trying to work out its magnitude, and that's taking some time, but the thing we're sampling is actually changing over time, that will in itself introduce an error. The way we solve that is at the point where we take the sample, we lock that amplitude, we hold that value, so that the calculation that we undertake on it to work out its magnitude is comparing it against this fixed value that we're holding. Now a circuit that actually provides this kind of being able to sample and then lock onto an amplitude uh, and not let it change uh, during the time that you're evaluating it is known as a sample that holds circuit. So, if I had a real signal that was doing this kind of thing, and I sample it at this point in time, then during the period that I'm actually doing the calculation of its magnitude, I would be using that value. Even though the input signal is actually changing more, we ignore that fact. The only time we take that into account is that the next sampling instance, up here, then we would hold that value. So we're holding the value in order to perform the calculation. Yeah. Once you're in the initial read, why would you want to change, would it? But you're not making, the initial read doesn't happen in one step usually. Um, in some of the circuits I'm going to show you tomorrow, um, there's a sequence of steps you're going through. And so it may take four discrete steps in here to actually determine its value. Now, you're saying when you initially sample at that point in time, 
um, you haven't completed the calculation. Uh, if you didn't have the whole circuit, when you're actually working out the magnitude of the next bit, you're going to get the, perhaps the wrong value and so forth. I'll show you tomorrow a couple of circuits, and then under those circumstances, you might start to believe why a sample and hold circuit might be a useful thing to have. So you can't just read it and then do calculations afterwards, it's got to be done. Well, effectively, that's what I am doing. I'm reading it, and I'm blocking what I'm reading. Then I'm doing the calculations. The calculations take an appreciable amount of time to work out. Um, what we don't want to do is to do the calculations live on the signal that's coming in, because this is continually changing. So, in order, all we really want to know is at that point in time, what was its magnitude? Now, we would not get at the correct answer if we didn't have a hold circuit, because as the calculations are, take time to perform, and they're sort of, they need a reference point to do their calculations on. If that was changing, it's like moving the goalposts as you do the calculation. But like, if you're reading a pin on that controller, you move them to a cumulator. You if it was that kind of thing, yeah, absolutely, that's okay, but it's not like that. So, and I'll, I'll try and convince you of that fact tomorrow. Okay, so tomorrow, um, what we've got, have another 20 odd slides to go. Hi. We're going to look at um, three or four different um, analog to digital conversion I circuits. I hate lectures. And then we'll yes. briefly yes. add digital to oh. analog conversion, and then that'll be the end of the course, and then we'll, I'll summarise uh, some things for revision. See yeah. you tomorrow, nice and early, 9 o'clock. <laughs> I'm in the middle of the lecture, but it'll feel weird because the lecture is just looking at it. Yeah. Ah.